part, you, a lot of times these, the people that I had worked with, the, the women, especially, they didn't want the story to define them. So they wanted to tell it in their own way and um, maybe not have it be edited. So it's different for every organization, but I think as long as there is some intention around creating policies and protocols, and then also really involving the client in their storytelling okay. and making sure that they don't think it's sort of like an exchange, you know, like, oh, if I don't tell my story, I'm not going to get to go to Rosie's place anymore. You know, right. making sure they understand the reason behind it and that they have complete control over it and how they're viewed and how they're portrayed and where it's going to be and how long it's going to be up and, and all mm. of those kinds of things. So I, Rosie's place, I mean, is a great example of, they have, they talk to women in crisis who willingly share their story, you know, and that's not for everybody, but that's what they do. They want to also mm. encourage other women to come forward and break the stigma around poverty and, and homelessness and things like that. So they, they have a multifaceted purpose for their storytelling. But um, I think every agency, as long as you're intentional and, yeah. you know, you, we're all, our hearts are hopefully all in the right place, but definitely I would Google ethical storytelling, go to the Goodman Center, mm -hmm. um, Andrew Goodman, the Goodman Center. They do a lot of work around storytelling with like vulnerable populations. Yeah, that's interesting. So Christopher's saying, so you let them tell their story on their terms. Which... Yeah, a lot of the time. It depends. I mean, so so like boys and girls clubs, you know, they their kids are maybe not necessarily in crisis or the I'm thinking actually that might not be the best example. Um the why where I live, of course you sign a waiver and then they would never post anything without emailing the parents. But they don't have as they don't have as much concern about telling the story not on the kids terms you know they kind of interview the kid maybe they get some quotes but <laughs> i would just think about the the best stories you've read in journalism you know and i i love the new york times i love npr i love um the atlantic and the way they tell stories is humanizing the person so not tokenizing them and not not um enhancing maybe the stereotypes or the myths and misconceptions that people might have and really expanding the worldview or expanding the notion of what this person is going through. Like there's so much more than just a domestic violence victim. Like what right. else is going on in their life? So as long as you're humanizing the person and making it a little bit more well-rounded, mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, that works really well. Yeah, and I liked what you said before about there doesn't necessarily need to be a happy ending. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you were getting towards really... that. I don't know if I don't know if you said it in those words or you know, they're still on their journey, but I think it's perfectly fine to share a story where the story isn't over or they went back to the abuser. There's not necessarily a happy ending. And I think that that's an important story to tell your donors that these issues are really challenging yes. because if they were easy to solve, then we would, all, you know, then we would have solved them and the world would yeah. be a wonderful, easy place. I think part of your job through storytelling is communicating just how oh, challenging yeah. these issues yep. are. I'm going to find so, this. It's called like the uh, ethical storytelling maze. I'm going to find right. this PDF and share it because I, okay. I also think it's perfectly imperfect. You're never going to be 100% perfect in your communications. You're never going to get everything right. Mm -hmm. And I just think putting things out there and then learning from your mistakes is also really important. And I, I just, I, you know, I did so many things wrong when I was a development director and I learned from them. Um, <laughs> I, I, all we can do is just try, try our best and put fail safes and protocols in place and then move forward and learn and fall and stumble and learn again. You know, Brene Brown has an amazing, um, quote on that, that I am probably mangling. I'm sure she does. Ooh, I found the PDF that I wanted to, I'm going to post it in the chat. Excellent. All right. So, um, I want to go to Doug's question, which takes mm -hmm. us a little further from what we're oh, talking like about. And then we'll go back to some other questions. But Doug's asking, um, he's responsible for corporate 
partnerships and sponsors, and the executive director does not want to share this on social media. That's the gist. Um, and so, what what are your thoughts on on tagging, promoting our corporate right. and 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 any donors, frankly? Yeah. Well, I, I think it depends. Do they want to be acknowledged is another huge piece of it. So if they want to be acknowledged, I would do it. What I wouldn't do is I would not post their logo and just say, thank you, Honda, for supporting our gala. First of all, that's boring to the people that are going to read it, your Facebook fans. That's bore, not going to get them any recognition and your engagement and reach are going to go way down. So the way that you can reframe it is trying to talk to them. And it could be a Zoom call that you record. Ask them, you know, what this cause means to them. How do they come to this organization? What are the three things that drive them and motivate them to stay involved with your cause, you know, X, Y, Z? And if, you know, dig deeper, have they been supporting your organization for 20 years? Well, wow, what have they learned? What are they excited about? What's their vision for this partnership? So treat them as real partners and humans. And that's going to, so that's going to do several things. One is that's going to create great social media content because social media loves video and stories mm -hmm. and humans <laughs> and faces. So that's going to create um, some great content for you to share. And then also it's going to get them a lot more exposure and notoriety. So not everybody's gonna be comfortable uh, getting on camera, maybe a photo of them in action or you know, the corporation painting your food bank, whatever it is, that kind of photo you can, you can share. But I, I really like to hear from donors and sponsors as to what drives them. What does this community mean to them? You know, what does this particular cause mean to them? What have they gained? What have they learned? What have they experienced? I think that it's a win-win for win-win. It's a win for your Facebook fans and your social media fans. It's a win for the sponsor and it's a win for your organization because um, actually I have an, an example of the Pine Street Inn in Boston, which is a homeless shelter. One of the leading um, furniture stores, this is before COVID shut everything down, but um, one of the leading furniture stores, there are two furniture stores in Boston that are like cutthroat in terms of competition. <laughs> One of them sponsored the Pine Street Inn Gala and the, the Pine Street Inn did this awesome video talking to the founders and walking them through the Pine Street Inn and all this. So the other furniture company, of course, was like, well, I can't be left out. So then they came in as a silver sponsor so that they could <laughs> get all of that recognition. So I think you can't underestimate the social proof, the power of peer pressure and the power of social proof. So I'm happy to share that story with you if you send me an email. I have all the Instagram posts yeah, I, because it was I such it was that. so funny when it happened. Of course people are more likely to share video and watch video. It's yep. so much more interesting than, you know, right, just posting a sponsor's logo. Who's gonna share <sighs> that? Who's I mean that's not gonna be right. No. Exactly. And I see that all the time mm -hmm. and it just doesn't work because it's not shareable, it's not likable, no one can comment on it, and it's just not interesting. And I know we always feel like we have to do that, but save the logos for like the t-shirt or the banner or the program, <laughs> but it's just don't put logos on social media. Yeah, so um, so Lauren's asking, and I, I, don't, I don't know. I these um, questions. Yeah, so Lauren's asking about the ethic, ethical storytelling in this current political and social climate that avoids tokenism and exploitation. You know, um, mm. they're working with a population and a, some percentage is, uh, is she says 8% mm -hmm. black, 34% Latina, 44% white. Um, so, you know, mm -hmm. is, there, is oh, yeah. there a rule or thought on that? So I worked with UMass Boston. They do pre-collegiate programs where they partner with Boston Public Schools. And I was working with a program called the Urban Scholars Program, and they take gifted and talented youth that are not in exam schools in Boston that don't have access to AP classes and tutors and things like that. Um, and they take them into this after school program at UMass Boston. So the issue 
as is the issue with many nonprofits was that the staff was entirely white, right? And I was white. I was a consultant at the time. I was white. I am white. And the <laughs> population change. is entirely like, I think that the term now is BIPOC. So like people of color, um, I, I know I'm always getting the terms wrong, but that just goes to show that I'm not perfect at all. So I really struggled with this, but I think, so what we ended up doing was that we had the kids do interview each other. So they, they did their own social media posts because what we had to do, and this actually gets into Brian's question about storytelling and grants. I was hired years ago to do the grant writing for them. And I said, we have to have student testimonials and quotes and things like that. Um, I can do that, but I would love if they talk to each other because they'd probably be more honest. Or if we could get students from UMass Boston that were maybe in the journalism program or in the nonprofit management program and they could come talk to them. So just trying to find ways to get the story that doesn't seem exploitative and, and tokenized. Um, but the other thing is like tokenization, it's, it's really, it's just whittling somebody down to one characteristic. So if you're talking about someone in a holistic way and talking about all of the pieces that make them this person, then I don't think that that's tokenization at all. If you're just talking about their one experience in one way mm -hmm. and how it relates to a certain stereotype or a certain myth or misconception, I think that's tokenization. The other thing I will say, I am not a DEI expert at all. So you probably would, you probably need to talk to like a diversity, equity, and inclusion expert. And there are hundreds of them. There are so many people that are incredibly talented in this area and can really work you through, you know, these kinds of issues at your organization. So I would say that's just, that's my experience, but I really don't claim to be like a DEI expert yeah. in any way. Excellent. All right, great. Um, so Susan is reminding us that if you're making a comment in the chat, please remember to send it to everybody to, um, yes. that means you have to drop down the blue box. And also, so oh, by POC, and yeah, by POC. Right. Sorry, someone's telling me. Yeah. Oh, and also Jordan's versus Bernie and Phil's. Yes, Susan, that's exactly who it was. I didn't want to call them out, but yes. <laughs> yes, uh, Susan's in clearly Boston a Bostonian. As well, obviously, yes. Okay. All right. Good. So, do you want to say anything about um, storytelling and grants, or we're good? Yeah, there? I wish that we would do more storytelling and grants. So, what we did, because there are so many um, after-school success programs in Boston. I mean, they're mm -hmm. like a dime a dozen. Honestly, they're really we had we had to stand out, which is good. They're needed. No, oh, they're needed, but like yeah. for a grantor, it's like, yeah. where do you stand out? You know, yeah. to, to propose your program to a funder in Boston is just, they're inundated. So what we did is we would have our cover letter be written by a teen or at least interview one of the teens in the program and have their story in the cover letter. Um, and then we would try to incorporate like anecdotes throughout, but you know how hard that is with um, character counts and, you know, all of that other stuff that you have to do. So I would try to put stories anywhere you can put additional material. So usually you can upload a video, usually you can upload additional documents and then always in the cover letter is what I would do. Great. And Lauren is saying here, um, girls interviewing girls would be a great change of pace for And wouldn't that be more so. fun? I would love <laughs> to see that. Yeah, that would be amazing. I think that would be um, really cool. That's a great example. All right, so Gary's asking about photos to go along yes. with your stories. I would imagine you have thoughts on photos, um, especially yeah. when it's on social. Oh, yes. I mean, if you're on Instagram, especially, it's a visual storytelling platform. So I, I don't want to dissuade you from getting on social media if you don't have perfect, professionally shot photos. But yes, a powerful photo. I mean, just think about your own way that you look at the front page of the paper. That's what your eye is drawn to. You look at a blog, you look at social media. I mean, that's what your eye is drawn to. And the other thing that's important to know is that people don't really read long captions. Like 
the photo has to capture their attention, has to be kind of the hook and the draw. And then the caption can tell them a little bit more about how they can actually help or get involved. And we're about to have a giant thunderstorm here. So if you hear that in the background. <laughs> or if you lose um, internet. Thankfully, because it was like 90 degrees today. All right, that's but, good. Yeah, a photo, you can't get away from it. I mean, we're visual creatures and that's what's yeah. going to stop the scroll on social media right. too. Right. It's not just on Instagram. It's on everything these days yeah. on, I mean, a few years ago on Twitter, there weren't photos or videos, mm -hmm. but now and LinkedIn, sudden, look at LinkedIn now too. Right. I yeah. mean, honestly, do you read anything with, if there's no photo or video, you just scroll. If it's more than a line, I bet you don't. Yeah. Um, all right. So Michelle is saying, let's see, um, Michelle's saying staff members are the ones with the relationships, yes. I'm guessing, with the clients. So the development director doesn't necessarily hear the stories firsthand. Yes. So how do we help staff members? And I'm totally paraphrasing, Michelle. So yep. I hope oh, no, I'm I getting your question. question right. But how do we help staff members um, get the stories to us? Are there bullet point questions to guide the conversation? How do we extract the stories and communicate them? I'm going to add back to the development department. Yes. So I will tell you first what you don't want to do. What you don't want to do is the Wednesday before your email newsletter goes out, <laughs> Friday, send an email and say, I need stories for the email newsletter. I have done that. I have definitely done that um, as a development director. It doesn't work. No one knows what that means. No one knows what you're asking and they get very intimidated when they hear the word story. So I, what I recommend and I, in my course that I just finished up, there's a whole component of like how you talk to staff and how you create a system so really quickly, what I recommend is creating like a Google Drive or a Dropbox folder, put examples in it. Because for me as a program officer, I'm not necessarily trained in marketing or writing or, or copywriting or, or any uh, social media. So I don't know what you mean. When you say story, I, I have no clue what you're talking about. So put some examples of screenshots or emails or things that you have received that you really like from other nonprofits, not even in your cause area, but just things that you think you could emulate and adapt and give them examples and then give them the questions. That's what you're gonna have to do. So our work as development directors is to make everything easier for other people to give us the information. So we're gonna knock down all the barriers. You have to you know, give them some ideas for questions and good questions include, what is your favorite memory? How did you feel when you came to us? How did you feel when you first went through our program? Whatever it is, asking for feelings because what you don't want is ideally you don't want just a recounting of things that happened. So you don't just want someone to say, Amy came to Rosie's place or Amy was tired. She came to Rosie's place. She slept and she left. Like that's a lot of what we get, you know, because it's just because people, people aren't trained in marketing and fundraising. Like a lot of, a lot of people right. have so to do it for years and years and do a lot of professional development and, and really be in it. So the program officer might think that that is okay, or that's what you are looking for. So giving examples, asking leading questions about feelings, and then really you got to talk to all of them. When I first had my very first development director job at the domestic violence shelter, I had to go and talk to every program officer because they were older. I was in Virginia. Um, many of them were women of color and many of them had no idea who I was or what I was doing, or they thought I'm going to explode everything. I'm going to exploit all the clients. I'm going to, I mean, <laughs> the trust has to be built up and you have to be speaking, you know, on, on similar terms and they have to, you know, kind of understand it's going to take a long time. It'll take some time. But if you build up those systems, you build up that Google Drive, you send them some leading questions. And then the other thing is, once you get a story, showcase it, tell everybody, go to a staff meeting and say, oh my gosh, like Sally gave me this awesome lead on a story and here's what we did with it and here's how we work together. Because when people don't have examples or a frame of reference, I think they tend to you know, hold their cards close to their chest. And they're very 
protective of the clients as they should be. That's their job. So really, um, yeah, showing examples, having as many protocols as possible, highlighting successes, and just talking to people and building up that trust. Yeah, but I think it does get back to, it's not a restatement of the facts. Yes. It is telling the why and the mm-hmm. feelings, right? The like feelings. Wh- yeah. So it's not that she showed up at the shelter, but why did she need to leave? You know, mm-hmm. why did she stay? Why didn't she have any place else to go? Mm-hmm. You know, those types of things. Um, so before we get to our next question, which I think I'm going to go to Katrina, because you just I love started it. <laughs> to, to talk about that. Um, so we're going to talk to... Um, posting the same story in on multiple pages and in multiple mm. on multiple platforms in just a minute. But everybody knows that I like to take a seventh inning stretch in the middle of these hour long sessions. So uh, whether it's a physical stretch, up. right? Yeah, no, well, you can do whatever you want. You take a deep breath. And this is your opportunity in just a minute, Julie, I'm going to let you remind, remind everybody to where to find you, how to find you. But first, I'm just going to remind everybody that Um, I just opened my brand new, completely revised Mastering Major Gifts course. Um, I don't know if I should call it a course anymore. It's not a course. It used to be a course. Now it's it's a a community. community. It is a community. And it just launched yesterday. um, And you can join. And it's totally revised for post-COVID virtual solicitation. I'm super excited about it. It's going to be a continuation of these community calls, but smaller, more intense, more directed and specific. We're gonna do breakout sessions. It's gonna be amazing. Um, So I encourage you and hope that you will join me. Um, And so what else was I gonna say about it? Oh, I just found out. Put the link. You gotta promote it. (laughs) Yeah, I'll put the link. Okay, you you. can put the link. I've been sending emails. It's. my, uh, what is the Mag- URL? Mag- Maggie's on here. She'll do it. Okay, it's let Maggie do it. You got to put it because it's really the emails that you've been sending have been really wonderful. Thanks. It's masteringmajorgifts.com backslash join or slash join masteringmajorgifts slash dot com slash join. Um, but oh, I was going to say five CFRE credits per month. So Ooh. they know CFRE knows that it's like five hours a month. It's, it's intense. It's real, the real deal. So if you really want to raise major gifts, this is your chance. Um, okay. So that was my infomercial, Julia. Now, um, before it. we get back to the next question, where can people find you when, when they have follow-up questions or when they're looking for your stuff and your site, put oh, all that yeah. as well. Um, I, and you know what? I have to look into getting CRFE, CRFE. E credits. C F R E credits, yes. For my <laughs> for my storytelling course. But um yeah, if you go to jcsocialmarketing.com, that's my blog. There's a contact page. Um, I'm gonna launch a social media course in September. And Great. it's like you said, 2.0 COVID, everything has changed. <laughs> so all the materials yes. are completely updated. But um yeah, I'm really excited about it too. But I love what you said about how it's not a course, it's a community. And I feel that same exact way. I mean, it's yeah. not just a bunch of PDFs and you just download it. Right. Um, I, I really, I think that's the new way to do online learning. So yeah. yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So back to our regularly scheduled program for, yes. from our seventh inning stretch. Okay. Yes. So uh, Katrina, we we're about to get to your question. So she says she manages multiple pages, as I imagine we all do. So she's tempted to schedule the same post story articles, pictures, probably across the, across the pages if the topics are related. So how do we keep the topics or stories unique um, while staying organized and streamlining our work? Because obviously me too, uh, you know, it's so much easier you say, okay, yeah. I have this great story and this great video or picture. I'm going to post it on Facebook, mm-hmm. Twitter, Instagram, you know, yeah. across LinkedIn, all my channels. How do we keep it fresh and make them different? Do we need to? Well, when she says pages, uh, so there's two ways you can go about. It. So if you're running multiple Facebook pages, like oh. multiple accounts on one social media platform, okay, you need to have a, a reason that you're doing that. So there needs to be a specific audience. So the way that we think about social media is, oh, it's for us. It's what it can do for us. But Mm. having multiple pages, is that going to confuse your audience? Is that because they don't necessarily care that you have 50 departments at your organization. They care about the problem that you're solving and they care about the solution that you're providing. So you have to 
really step back from being the development director and try to be the donor and be that audience member and say, oh, if there are five Facebook pages for this one organization, why would I follow all five? I wouldn't. And which one would I follow? And is it confusing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In terms, I mean, that yeah, I never, you never have multiple Facebook pages unless you have distinct audiences. So one audience is your donors, one audience is your clients, and they are 100% separate. That's the only mm. reason that you would do that. I mean, accounts on the same platform. When you're using multiple platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, you absolutely can repurpose but you have to know that each of these each of these platforms are their own country so they have their own language and their own etiquette and their own manners so you would not buy a guidebook for germany if you were going to south africa you just <laughs> would not because on instagram you can use 30 hashtags no one bats an eyelash if you use 30 hashtags on linkedin people would think you were nuts or they would think it was spam or it just yeah. wouldn't look right. Or if you, I'm just thinking like there's, there's so many things where you can repurpose the content. So Andy Goodman, who of course I keep referencing, but he says, you know, the story is the gold and then you mold it depending on what you're trying to do. Are you making a bracelet? Are you making a necklace? Are you making a watch? So we have to think about social media content the same way. So what works on Instagram, maybe you're a little more casual, maybe you use some more hashtags. If you're on Facebook, maybe you are, you know, the, the photo is formatted in a horizontal way versus a vertical way. Instagram stories, those are all vertical. So you have to know the ins and outs and the best practices of each platform. But I absolutely think you can repurpose it because what we like, what we, what we think is, oh, everyone's going to get so sick and tired of seeing the same story. No, because no, like two, 3% <laughs> of your audience is seeing it on each platform. Right. There's, there's no, I have never in my entire life on social media ever, unless I'm researching a client, seen the same post on LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook ever. So mm. it just is not something that's going to happen. But also if it's something that you're proud of and it's a really great story, it doesn't matter if people are seeing it twice. Right. You'd be lucky if people see it once. <laughs> and if people see it yeah. twice, that is that's awesome. So if I you have a really, really great reminder. story, absolutely yeah. be repurposing it. And a lot of the time, and use it in your email and use it on your website. Um, because you want to get it out in front of a lot of people. So, you know, I, I think that we all think we're going to be inundating our followers, but the reality is that, you know, if they do see it on Facebook or Twitter, that's awesome. They're not going to see it on five sites. It's just, yeah, that's, yeah. it's such the a deck good is stacked against us in that, that way. That, that because of the algorithms, mm -hmm. the likelihood or the timing of it, the likelihood that they're going to see yeah. And if you're concerned about timing, you know, then do one, one hour, one, one hour, one, one hour, but it's mm -hmm. the algorithms yeah. are not chronological and people don't see things when it's posted. You know, people see things, they can see things two or three days later if yeah. they haven't logged into Instagram for three days or, you know, so I, I wouldn't worry. I wouldn't worry about that. All right. So Alicia's asking a good question. Um, what is the best way to learn? What is the best practice for each platform? Because all of the things that you're talking about, I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> obviously, you know, you can, you can really look at Instagram and figure out that there's more hashtags or less hashtags on Facebook or Twitter, but where do you go to learn this stuff um, without just sort of yeah. guessing, uh, you know? Well, I mean, I, I have to plug my course because that's what my course <laughs> plug, literally plug. is. It's, <laughs> it's social media management for nonprofits and it's best practices for each platform. But if you follow, you know, social media examiner is one of my favorite blogs. They do one post per day mm -hmm. and it's always very, very specific. So what I like to do with them is I have different um, file folders for bookmarks. So I'll have like Instagram and like anytime I see an article that they post on Instagram, I'll save it there. And then I just spend 
an hour, two hours a week, just learning. So I don't do it as I go because that's so overwhelming. So I would find some kind of bookmarking software like pocket or Evernote. And anytime you see an article that you think looks really interesting, kind of bookmark it. The other challenge just is that it's constantly changing. Mm. So you cannot be expected to know every feature every new, you know, shiny object, every, everything. So what I would recommend is just being consistent on two platforms, maybe three, if you have the bandwidth and then looking at your insights because your audience is going to tell you. So your, your audience is going to tell you every time you post if this is a good post or not. I mean, I would give it 48 hours. I'd give it maybe a week. Right. So they're either going to share a little it, bit. they're going to like it, or they're not. Yeah. Right? So yeah, yeah. I, I can, I already know. I mean, my Instagram, I don't really use it for, for marketing that much. I already know the pictures of my kids get twice the likes as pictures of me. I mean, that, <laughs> I just know it because I yeah. see it. So right. it's just using the platform consistently and trying to measure and analyze for your particular audience, what you're doing, because honestly, the best practices, sometimes you want to throw them out the window. Sometimes you, you, you know, sometimes on Instagram, oh, posting at 5 p.m. on Tuesday is a best practice. Well, maybe if you're on the East Coast, but what if you're in Singapore? You know, what if you're in a different time zone? <laughs> right. So I would take best practices with a grain of salt, but I would, I would look at what others in your industry are doing and I would look at what you're doing and, and see if you can really figure out what's resonating with your particular audience because they're different. Yeah. Everybody has a different audience on this call. Some people have te teachers. That's a great example. You're not going to post at 9am on a Monday if you're targeting <laughs> teachers. Right. They're no, never it's just not, it. that's not when they're on. So you have to really look at your audience and, and what they're doing. So read those articles, save them in a folder, you know, but, but take it with a grain of salt and do what you're doing and see what works for your audience. Yeah, but I, I would say, you know, for all of the one person development shops on here, which I think the vast majority of people are in small development Ooh, shops, you know, pick one or two uh, platforms to start on. And the way that I would pick is survey your donors. Um, send a survey by email to your donors and ask, you know, which platform do you visit the most often? Yep. Is it oh, Facebook? Oh, absolutely is it LinkedIn? survey. Right. So um, ask your board members, what are they on? What are they yep. most likely to see on? So if you only have the bandwidth to do to manage one platform and it happens to be Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever it is, it's partly going to be your demographic and your audience. Yeah. Um, I would pick, you know, so and, and you may need to have two different audiences. Your clients may be a very different audience from your donors yep. Yep. and you would oh, be right. posting different stuff. And so, you know, do you have accounts that you're mostly talking to your donors or are you mostly talking to your clients? Um, so anyways, I just thought I'd throw that in there. All right. We have prime, probably time for one or this two. This has gone so are, fast. Are, are there any that are catching your eye that you really oh. want to, um, or do you want me to just keep going, Julia? Ooh, I one. love this social media fundraising pieces. Okay. That made you cry or pump your fist, a story that put a surprising face on the statistics. Wow. Okay. So ugh, social media, I recommend using Aristotle's method of persuasion. So who would have thought that we were using Aristotle to refer to <laughs> social media, but I'm going to try to remember this. So all of your posts should be in one of three buckets. Um, ethos, pathos, and logos. So ethos mm. is what you stand for and are you credible? Like, are you a credible source of information? Are you a credible place for me to give my donations? Pathos is the problem you're solving. Mm. Is this a real problem? And that's where statistics come in. You know, one in three women will experience domestic and sexual violence in her lifetime. Like that's a statistic that should make everybody kind of sit up and pay attention. So statistics that are going to make me pay attention, you absolutely can use those. But for fundraising, you have to have, what is ethos, pathos, logos? You have to have pathos, which is emotion, that emotional connection. So you can use 
ethos and logos all day. You can say, I've been in the community for 60 years and here's all the awards that we've won and we're in the news and use statistics and this is a problem. To get someone to pull out their wallet, you have to use pathos, which is that emotional connection and that's where the story comes in. So some of the social media fundraising posts I've seen that make me want to pull my hair out is are using like, we are a credible place because our board member got this award. It's like, that's not going to make, that's going to make me, you know, maybe convince me that you are a credible person to give money to, but it's not an emotional connection that's going to make me pull out my wallet. So in social media, it has to be timely and urgent. You know, why now? Why this? What is the money going to? The fundraising principles still apply, no matter the tool. The principles of fundraising still apply. I have to care about the problem and I have to know that you're providing a solution that I care about. So yeah. there's nothing simple. There's not, it's not simple, but um, I think relying too much on statistics when you're trying to fundraise, you can get in trouble. What do you, th what do you think, Amy? You probably have an so. opinion on that too. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree with you. All right, so listen, I wanna give you actually the last two or three minutes Yay, to There's so to many say, questions. I know, but I closed them, I closed them. Okay. You're gonna get, you're gonna get the last word. So tell, what, what do you wanna leave people with? What do you want, what are your key takeaways for people in terms of uh, storytelling and social media? What, what are the most important things for people to be paying attention to or doing right now? Um, in, yep. the, in this COVID world we're living in? Number one, don't think that people aren't giving because we know they're giving. So people are in crisis. Um, everyone is on their own journey. You know, the saying is we are not all in the same boat, but we're all in the same storm. People are giving. So if you're not comfortable asking people for money right now, at least be communicating with them. They want to know. There's no such thing as a non-COVID essential charity, right? The community house where I live that has community theater, I've supported them for years. They are essential to me. So don't make that decision for your donor and don't go silent on your social media channels because people want to know what's happening. Are you opening up? What are you doing? Like, what, what do we need to know? What, you know, how has this cause been affected because of coronavirus, because of unrest, because of these right. you know, uncertain times, which we always say. So I think what I would leave you with is, you know, you are important, you are vital, you are doing truly, truly transformational work and your donors want to hear from you, even if it's not asking them for money. In fact, they do want to hear from you when you're not asking them for money. <laughs> But and you that's should be kind of what social media should be for, I, right? I, I have to tell you, you should be asking them for money, but in you should be lots of times when you're we're sharing information, engaging them, asking questions. So I'm I'm totally with you, Julia. Yep. I think that actually is the perfect perfect uh, note to to wrap up on. Yes. Is that you? Thank should you so much. Educating, um, your donors and your community needs to hear from you. What's going on with you? What are you doing? What are the current programs and services? What happened with your donor your what with your clients what's happening yeah. with your staff and what's going on with the cause know. what's what yeah. do i need to know about you know food insecurity in my town like is this a what do i need to know because i care yeah. about it so tell me like communicate with me like i think i saw i saw it best the other day on a webinar um don't assume for your donors yeah. never assume for your donors yeah, yeah. All right, you guys, listen, I want to tell everybody um, next week is the last one of these town halls. I have been doing them since mid-March, right when the crisis started. Wow. Um, it was my commitment to you that I would do them for as long as the, the hot crisis lasted. And, um, you know, unfortunately, it looks like this is going to go on for a long, long time. It's going to go on time. for a long time. So, so the good news is that um, I'm picking them back up on Mondays in September with my partner, Andrea Kilstead at the Capital Campaign Toolkit. You'll all know about those. So we will continue in September um, in a slightly different format. But um, I will see you next week for the last one of the this series. But Julia, Thank you so much for joining Aww, us. This was you. amazing, amazing. I, I learned so much today, so thank you. <laughs> the questions were fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Amy. It's an amazing community. All right, bye, guys. Have a great week. I'll see you next week. Stay well. Bye.